Into almost every anthropogeographical problem the element of environment enters in different phases, with different modes of operation and varying degrees of importance. Since the causal conception of geography demands a detailed analysis of all the relations between environment and human development, it is advisable to distinguish the various classes of geographic influences. Physical Effects Four fundamental classes of effects can be distinguished. 1. The first class includes direct physical effects of environment, similar to those exerted on plants and animals by their habitat. Certain geographic conditions, more conspicuously those of climate, apply certain stimuli to which man, like the lower animals, responds by an adaption of his organism to his environment. Many physiological peculiarities of man are due to physical effects of environment, which doubtless operated very strongly in the earliest stages of human development, and in those shadowy ages contributed to the differentiation of races. The unity of the human species is as clearly established as the diversity of races and peoples, whose divergences must be interpreted chiefly as modifications in response to various habitats in long periods of time. Variation in Natural Conditions Such modifications have probably been numerous in the persistent and unending movements, shiftings, and migrations which have made up the long prehistoric history of man. If the origin of species is found in variability and inheritance, variation is undoubtedly influenced by a change of natural conditions. To quote Darwin, in one sense the conditions of life may be said, not only to cause variability, either directly or indirectly, but likewise to include natural selection, for the conditions determine whether this or that variety shall survive. 34 The variability of man does not mean that every external influence leaves its mark upon him, but that man is an organism, by the preservation of beneficent variations and the elimination of deleterious ones, is gradually adapted to his environment, so that he can utilize most completely that which it contributes to his needs. This self-maintenance under outward influences is an essential part of the conception of life which Herbert Spencer defines as the correspondence between internal conditions and external circumstances, or August Kant as the harmony between the living being and the surrounding medium or milieu. According to Firko, the distinction of races rests upon hereditary variations, but heredity itself cannot become active till the characteristic or zustand is produced which is to be handed down. Point thirty five. But environment determines what variation shall become stable enough to be passed on by heredity. For instance, we can hardly err in attributing the great lung capacity, massive chests, and abnormally large torsos of the Quechua and Aymara Indians inhabiting the high Andean plateaus to the rarefied air found at an altitude of 10,000 or 15,000 feet above sea level. Whether these have been acquired by centuries of extreme lung expansion, or represent the survival of a chance variation of undoubted advantage, they are a product of the environment. They are a serious handicap when the Amira Indian descends to the plains, where he either dies off or leaves descendants with diminishing chests. Point 36, see map page 101. Stature and Environment Darwin holds that many slight changes in animals and plants, such as size, color, thickness of skin and hair, have been produced through food supply and climate from the external conditions under which the forms lived. Point 37 Paul Ehrenreich, while regarding the chief race distinctions as permanent forms, not to be explained by external conditions, nevertheless concedes the slight and slow variation of the subrace under changing conditions of food and climate is beyond doubt. Point 38 Stature is partly a Matter of feeding and hence of geographic condition. In mountain regions, where the food resources are scant, the varieties of wild animals are characterized by smaller size in general than our corresponding species in the lowlands. It is a noticeable fact that dwarfed horses or ponies have originated in islands, in Iceland, the Shetlands, Corsica, and Sardinia. This is due either to scanty and unvaried food or to excessive inbreeding, or probably to both. The horses introduced into the Falkland Islands in 1764 have deteriorated so in size and strength in a few generations that they are in a fair way to develop a Falkland variety of pony. Point 39. On the other hand, 
Mr. Homer Davenport states that the purebred Arabian horses raised on his New Jersey stock farm are in the third generation a hand higher than their grandsires imported from Arabia and of more angular build. The result is due to more abundant and nutritious food and the elimination of long desert journeys. The low stature of the natives prevailing in certain misery spots of Europe, as in the Auvergne Plateau of southern France, is due in part to race, in part to a disastrous artificial selection by the immigration of the taller and more robust individuals, but in considerable part to the harsh climate and starvation food yield of that sterile soil, for the children of the region, if removed to the more fertile valleys of the Loire and Garonne, grow to average stature.40 The effect of a scant and uncertain food supply is especially clear in savages, who have erected fewer buffers between themselves and the pressure of environment. The bushmen of the Kalahari Desert are shorter than their Hottentot kindred who pastured their flocks and herds in the neighboring grasslands. 41 Samoyeds, Laps, and other Hyperborean races of Eurasia are shorter than their more southern neighbors, the physical record of an immemorial struggle against cold and hunger. The stunted forms and wretched aspect of the snake Indians inhabiting the Rocky Mountain deserts distinguish these clans from the tall buffalo hunting tribes of the plains. 42 Any feature of geographic environment tending to affect directly the physical vigor and strength of a people cannot fail to prove a potent factor in their history. Physical Effects of Dominant Activities Oftentimes environment modifies the physique of a people indirectly by imposing upon them certain predominant activities, which may develop one part of the body almost to the point of deformity. This is the effect of increased use or disuse which Darwin discusses. He attributes the thin legs and thick arms of the Piaguas Indians living along the Paraguay River to generations of lives spent in canoes, with the lower extremities motionless and the arm and chest muscles in constant exercise. 43 Livingstone found these same characteristics of broad chests and shoulders with ill developed legs among the Barats of the Upper Zambesi. 44 And they have been observed in pronounced form, coupled with distinctly impaired powers of locomotion, among the Tlingit, Simshian, and Haida Indians of the southern Alaskan and British Columbia coast where the geographic conditions of a mountainous and almost strandless shore interdicted agriculture and necessitated seafaring activities. Point 45 An identical environment has produced a like physical effect upon the canoemen of Tierra del Fuego 46 and the Aleutian Islanders, who often sit in their boats 20 hours at a time. Point 47 These special adaptations are temporary in their nature and tend to disappear with change. Of occupation, as, for instance, among the Tlingit Indians, who develop improved leg muscles when employed as laborers in the salmon canneries of British Columbia. Effects of climate Both the direct and indirect physical effects of environment thus far instanced are obvious in themselves and easily explained. Far different is it with the majority of physical effects, especially those of climate, whose mode of operation is much more obscure than was once supposed. The modern geographer does not indulge in the naive hypothesis of the last century, which assumed a prompt and direct effect of environment upon the form and features of man. Carl Ritter regarded the small, slit eyes and swollen lids of the Turkoman as an obvious effect of the desert upon the organism. Stanhope Smith ascribed the high shoulders and short neck of the Tartars of Mongolia to their habit of raising their shoulders to protect the neck against the cold, their small, squinting eyes, overhanging brows, broad faces and high cheekbones, to the effect of the bitter, driving winds and the glare of the snow, till, he says, every feature by the action of the cold is harsh and distorted. 48 These profound influences of a severe climate upon physiognomy he finds also among the laps. Northern Mongolians, Samoyeds, and Eskimo. Acclimatization Most of these problems are only secondarily grist for the geographer's mill. For instance, when the Aryans descended to the enervating lowlands of tropical India, and in that debilitating climate lost the qualities which first gave them supremacy, the change which they underwent was primarily a physiological one. It can be scientifically described and explained therefore only by physiologists and physicochemists, and upon their investigations the geographer must wait before he approaches the problem from the standpoint of geographical distribution. 
Into this subclass of physical effects come all questions of acclimatization. Point 49 These are important to the anthropogeographer, just as they are to colonial governments like England or France, because they affect the power of national or racial expansion and fix the historical fate of tropical lands. The present populations of the Earth represent physical adaptation to their environments. The intense heat and humidity of most tropical lands prevent any permanent occupation by a native-born population of pure whites. The Kataral zone north of the 40th parallel in America soon exterminates the Negroes.50. The Indians of South America, though all fundamentally of the same ethnic stock, are variously acclimated to the warm, damp, forested plains of the Amazon, to the hot, dry, treeless coasts of Peru, and to the cold, arid heights of the Andes. The habitat that bred them tends to hold them, by restricting the range of climate which they can endure. In the zone of the Andean slope lying between 4,000 and 6,000 feet of altitude, which produces the best-flavored coffee and which must be cultivated, the imported Indians from the high plateaus and from the low Amazon plains alike sicken and die after a short time so that they take employment on these coffee plantations for only three or five months, and then return to their own homes. Labor becomes nomadic on these slopes, and in the intervals these farmlands of intensive agriculture show the anomaly of a sparse population only of resident managers. Point 51 Similarly in the high, dry Himalayan valley of the upper Indus, over 10,000 feet above sea level, the natives of Ladakh are restricted to a habitat that yields them little margin of food for natural growth of population but forbids them to emigrate in search of more, applies at the same time the lash to drive and the leash to hold, for these highlanders soon die when they reach the plains. Point 52 Here are two antagonistic geographic influences at work from the same environment, one physical and the other social-economic. The Ladakhi have reached an interesting resolution of these two forces by the institution of polyandry, which keeps population practically stationary. Pigmentation and Climate The relation of pigmentation to climate has long interested geographers as a question of environment, but their speculations on the subject have been barren, because the preliminary investigations of the physiologist, physicist and chemist are still incomplete. The general fact of increasing nigrescence from temperate towards equatorial regions is conspicuous enough, despite some irregularity of the shading. Point 53 This fact points strongly to some direct relation between climate and pigmentation, but gives no hint how the pigmental processes are affected. The physiologist finds that in the case of the Negro, the dark skin is associated with a dense cuticle, diminished perspiration, smaller chests, and less respiratory power, a lower temperature and more rapid pulse, 54 all which variations may enter into the problem of the Negro's coloring. The question is therefore by no means simple. Yet it is generally conceded by scientists that pigment is a protective device of nature. The Negro's skin is comparatively insensitive to a sun heat that blisters a white man. Livingstone found the bodies of albino Negroes in Bechuanaland always blistered on exposure to the sun. 55 An alike effect has been observed among albino Polynesians and Melanesians of Fiji. 56 Paul Ehrenreich finds that the degree of coloration depends less upon annual temperature than upon the direct effect of the sun's rays, and that therefore a people dwelling in a cool, dry climate, but exposed to the sun may be darker than another in a hot, moist climate but living in a dense forest. The forest-dwelling Batacudos of the upper San Francisco River in Brazil are fairer than the kindred Kayapo tribe, who inhabit the open campos, and the Arawak of the Perus River forests are lighter than their fellows in the central Mato Grosso.57. Seafaring coast folk, who are constantly exposed to the sun, especially in the tropics, show a deeper pigmentation than their kindred of the wooded interior.58 The coast moros of western Mindanao are darker than the Sabanos, their Malay brethren of the back country, the lightness of whose color can be explained by their forest life. Point 59 So the Duwalas of the Cameron coast of Africa are darker than the Bakwiri inhabiting the forested mountains just behind them, though both tribes belong to the Bantu group of people. Point 60 Here light, in contradistinction to heat, appears the dominant factor in pigmentation. A recent theory, advanced by von Schmettel in 1895, rests upon the chemical power of light. 
It holds that the black pigment renders the negro skin insensitive to the luminous or actinic effects of solar radiation, which are far more destructive to living protoplasm than the merely calorific effects. Point 61. Pigmentation and altitude. Coloration responds to other more obscure influences of environment. A close connection between pigmentation and elevation above sea level has been established. A high altitude operates like a high latitude. Blondness increases appreciably on the higher slopes of the Black Forest, Vosges Mountains, and Swiss Alps, though these isolated highlands are the stronghold of the brunette alpine race. 62 Livy, in his treatise on military anthropometry, deduced a special action of mountains upon pigmentation on observing a prevailing increase of blondness in Italy above the 400 meter line a phenomenon which came out as strongly in Basilicata and Calabria provinces of the south as in Piedmont and Lombardy in the north. Point 63 The dark Hamitic Berbers of northern Africa have developed an unmistakable blonde variant in high valleys of the Atlas Range, which in a subtropical region rises to the height of 12,000 feet. Here among the Kabyles the population is fair, gray, blue or green eyes are frequent, as is also reddish blonde or chestnut hair. Point 64 Waits long ago affirmed this tendency of mountaineers to lighter coloring from his study of primitive peoples. Point 65 The modification cannot be attributed wholly to climatic contrast between mountain and plain. Some other factor, like the economic poverty of the environment and the poor food supply, as Livy suggests, has had a hand in the result but just what it is or how it has operated cannot yet be defined. Point 66. Difficulty of generalization. Enough has been said to show that the geographer can formulate no broad generalization as to the relation of pigmentation and climate from the occurrence of the darkest skins in the tropics, because this fact is weakened by the appearance also of lighter tints in the hottest districts, and of darker ones in arctic and temperate regions. The geographer must investigate the questions when and where deeper shades develop in the skins of fair races, what is the significance of dark skins in the cold zones and of fair ones in hot zones. His answer must be based largely on the conclusions of physiologists and physicists, and only when these have reached a satisfactory solution of each detail of the problem can the geographer summarize the influence of environment upon pigmentation. The rule can therefore safely be laid down that in all investigation of geographic influences upon the permanent physical characteristics of races, the geographic distribution of these should be left out of consideration till the last, since it so easily misleads. Point 67 Moreover, owing to the ceaseless movements of mankind, these effects do not remain confined to the region that produced them, but pass on with the wandering throng in whom they have once developed, and in whom they endure or vanish according as they prove beneficial or deleterious in the new habitat. Psychical effects Two, more varied and important are the psychical effects of geographic environment. As direct effects they are doubtless bound up in many physiological modifications, and as influences of climate, they help differentiate peoples and races in point of temperament. They are reflected in man's religion and his literature, in his modes of thought and figures of speech. Blackstone states that, in the Isle of Man, to take away a horse or ox was no felony, but a trespass, because of the difficulty in that little territory to conceal them or to carry them off, but to steal a pig or a fowl, which is easily done, was a capital misdemeanor, and the offender punished with death. The judges or deemsters in this island of fishermen swore to execute the laws as impartially as the herring's backbone doth lie in the middle of the fish, 68 The whole mythology of the Polynesians is an echo of the encompassing ocean. The cosmography of every primitive people, their first crude effort in the science of the universe, bears the impress of their habitat. The Eskimos' hell is a place of darkness, storm and intense cold, 69 The Jews is a place of eternal fire. Buddha, born in the steaming Himalayan Piedmont, fighting the lassitude induced by heat and humidity, pictured his heaven as nirvana, the cessation of all activity and individual life. Indirect effect upon language Intellectual effects of environment may appear in the enrichment of a language in one direction to a rare nicety of expression, but this may be combined with a meager vocabulary in all other directions. 
The greatest cattle breeders among the native Africans, such as the Hereros of Western Damaraland and the Dinkas of the Upper White Nile, have an amazing choice of words for all colors describing their animals brown, dun, red, white, dapple, and so on in every gradation of shade and hue. The Samoyeds of northern Russia have 11 or 12 terms to designate the various grays and browns of their reindeer, despite their otherwise low cultural development. Point 70 The speech of nomads has an abundance of expressions for cattle in every relation of life. It includes different words for breeding, pregnancy, death, and slaughtering in relation to every different kind of domestic animal. The Magyars, among whom pastoral life still survives on the low plains of the Danube and Tice, have a generic word for herd, sorta, and special terms for herds of cattle, horses, sheep, and swine. Point 71 While the vocabulary of Malays and Polynesians is especially rich in nautical terms, the Kyrgyz shepherd tribes who wander over the highlands of Western Asia from the Tian Shan to the Hindu Kush have four different terms for four kinds of mountain passes. A dabin is a difficult, rocky defile, an art is very high and dangerous, a bell is a low, easy pass, and a kittle is a broad opening between low hills. Point 72. To such influence as man is a passive subject, especially in the earlier stages of his development, but there are more important influences emanating from his environment which affect him as an active agent, challenge his will by furnishing the motives for its exercise, give purpose to his activities, and determine the direction which they shall take. Point 73 These mold his mind and character through the media of his economic and social life, and produce effects none the less important because they are secondary. About these anthropogeography can reach surer conclusions than regarding direct psychical effects, because it can trace their mode of operation as well as define the result. Direct psychical effects are more matters of conjecture, whose causation is asserted rather than proved. They seem to float in the air, detached from the solid ground underfoot, and are therefore subject matter for the psychologist rather than the geographer. The Great Man in History what of the great man in this geographical interpretation of history? It seems to take no account of him, or to put him into the melting pot with the masses. Both are to some extent true. As a science, anthropogeography can deal only with large averages, and these exclude or minimize the exceptional individual. Moreover, geographic conditions which give this or that bent to a nation's purposes and determine its aggregate activities have a similar effect upon the individual, but he may institute a far-seeing policy, to whose wisdom only gradually is the people awakened. The acts of the great man are rarely arbitrary or artificial, he accelerates or retards the normal course of development, but cannot turn it counter to the channels of natural conditions. As a rule he is a product of the same forces that made his people. He moves with them and is followed by them under a common impulse. Daniel Boone, that picturesque figure leading the van of the westward movement over the Allegheny Mountains, was bored of his frontier environment and found a multitude of his kind in that region of backwoods farms to follow him into the wilderness. Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, in the Louisiana Purchase, carried out the policy of expansion adumbrated in Governor Spotswood's expedition with the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe over the Blue Ridge in 1712. Jefferson's daring consummation of the purchase without government authority showed his community of purpose with the majority of the people. Peter the Great's location of his capital at St. Petersburg, usually stigmatized as the act of a despot, was made in response to natural conditions offering access to the Baltic nations, just as certainly as ten centuries before similar conditions and identical advantages led the early Russian merchants to build up a town at nearby Novgorod an easy water connection with the Baltic Commerce. Point 74. Economic and Social Effects Three geographic conditions influence the economic and social development of a people by the abundance, paucity, or general character of the natural resources, by the local ease or difficulty of securing the necessaries of life, and by the possibility of industry and commerce afforded by the environment. From the standpoint of production and exchange, these influences are primarily the subject matter of economic and commercial geography, but since they also permeate national life, determine or modify its social structure, condemn it to the dwarfing effects of national poverty, or open to it the cultural and political possibilities resident in national wealth, 
They are legitimate material also for anthropogeography. Size of the social group They are especially significant because they determine the size of the social group. This must be forever small in areas of limited resources or of limited extent, as in the little islands of the world and the yet smaller oases. The desert of Chinese Turkestan supports, in certain detached spots of river-borne fertility, populations like the 60,000 of Kashgar, and from this size groups all the way down to the single families which young husband found living by a mere trickle of a stream flowing down the southern slope of the Tian Shan. Small islands, according to their size, fertility, and command of trade, may harbor a sparse and scant population, like the 500 souls struggling for an ill-fed existence on the barren Westman Isles of Iceland, or a compact, teeming, yet absolutely small social group, like that crowding Malta or the Bermudas. Whether sparsely or compactly distributed, such groups suffer the limitations inherent in their small size. They are forever excluded from the historical significance attaching to the large, continuously distributed populations of fertile continental lands. Effect upon movements of peoples For the next class belongs exclusively to the domain of geography, because it embraces the influence of the features of the Earth's surface in directing the movements and ultimate distribution of mankind. It includes the effect of natural barriers, like mountains, deserts, swamps, and seas, in obstructing or deflecting the course of migrating people and in giving direction to national expansion. It considers the tendency of river valleys and treeless plains to facilitate such movements, the power of rivers, lakes, bays, and oceans either to block the path or open a highway. According as navigation is in a primitive or advanced stage, and finally the influence of all these natural features in determining the territory which a people is likely to occupy, and the boundaries which shall separate from their neighbors. River Routes The lines of expansion followed by the French and English in the settlement of America and also the extent of territory covered by each were powerfully influenced by geographic conditions. The early French explorers entered the great east-west waterway of the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes, which carried them around the northern end of the Appalachian Barrier into the heart of the continent, planted them on the low, swampy, often navigable watershed of the Mississippi, and started them on another river voyage of nearly 2,000 miles to the Gulf of Mexico. Here were the conditions and temptation for almost unlimited expansion, hence French Canada reached to the head of Lake Superior, and French Louisiana to the sources of the Missouri, to the lot of the English fell a series of short rivers with fertile valleys, nearly barred at their not distant sources by a wall of forested mountains, but separated from one another by low watersheds which facilitated lateral expansion over a narrow belt between mountains and sea. Here a region of mild climate and fertile soil suited to agriculture, enclosed by strong natural boundaries, made for compact settlement, in contrast to the wide diffusion of the French. Later, when a growing population pressed against the western barrier, mountain gates opened at Cumberland Gap and the Mohawk Valley, the Ohio River and the Great Lakes became interior thoroughfares, and the northwestern prairies lines of least resistance to the western settler. Rivers played the same part in directing and expediting this forward movement, as did the Lena and the Amur in the Russian advance into Siberia, the Humber and the Trent in the progress of the Angles into the heart of Britain the Rhone and Danube and the march of the Romans into Central Europe. Segregation and Accessibility The geographical environment of a people may be such as to segregate them from others, and thereby to preserve or even intensify their natural characteristics, or it may expose them to extraneous influences, to an infusion of new blood and new ideas, till their peculiarities are toned down, their distinctive features of dialect or national dress or provincial customs eliminated, and the people as a whole approach to the composite type of civilized humanity. A land shut off by mountains or sea from the rest of the world tends to develop a homogeneous people, since it limits or prevents the intrusion of foreign elements, or when once these are introduced, it encourages their rapid assimilation by the strongly interactive life of a confined locality. Therefore large or remote islands are, as a rule, distinguished by the unity of their inhabitants in point of civilization and race characteristics. 
Witness Great Britain, Ireland, Japan, Iceland, as also Australia and New Zealand at the time of their discovery. The highlands of the southern Appalachians, which form the mountain backyards of Kentucky, Tennessee, and North Carolina, are peopled by the purest English stock in the United States, descendants of the backwoods men of the late 18th century. Difficulty of access and lack of arable land have combined to discourage immigration. In consequence, foreign elements, including the elsewhere ubiquitous Negro, are wanting, except along the few railroads which in recent years have penetrated this country. Here survive an 18th century English, Christmas celebrated on Twelfth Night, the spinning wheel, and a belief in Joshua's power to arrest the course of the sun.75. An easily accessible land is geographically hospitable to all newcomers, facilitates the mingling of peoples, the exchange of commodities and ideas. The amalgamation of races in such regions depends upon the similarity or diversity of the ethnic elements and the duration of the common occupation. The broad, open valley of the Danube from the Black Sea to Vienna contains a bizarre mixture of several stocks, Turks, Bulgarians, various families of pure Slavs, Romanians, Hungarians, and Germans. These elements are too diverse and their occupation of the valley too recent for amalgamation to have advanced very far as yet. The maritime plain and open river valleys of northern France show a complete fusion of the native Celts with the Saxons, Franks, and Normans who have successively drifted into the region, just as the Teutonic and Scanter Slav elements have blended in the Baltic plains from the Elba to the Vistula. Change of Habitat Here are four different classes of geographic influences, all which may become active in modifying a people when it changes its habitat. Many of the characteristics acquired in the old home still live on, or at best yield slowly to the new environment. This is especially true of the direct physical and psychical effects. But a country may work a prompt and radical change in the social organization of an immigrant people by the totally new conditions of economic life which it presents. These may be either greater wealth or poverty of natural resources than the race has previously known, new stimulants or deterrence to commerce and intercourse, and new conditions of climate which affect the efficiency of the workmen and the general character of production. From these a whole complex mass of secondary effects may follow. The Aryans and Mongols, leaving their homes in the cool barren highlands of Central Asia where nature dispensed her gifts with a miserly hand, and coming down to the hot, low, fertile plains of the Indian rivers, underwent several fundamental changes in the process of adaptation to their new environment. An enervating climate did its work in slaking their energies, but more radical still was the change wrought by the contrast of poverty and abundance, enforced asceticism and luxury, presented by the old and new home. The restless, tireless shepherds became a sedentary, agricultural people, the abstemious nomads, spare, sinewy, strangers to indulgence, became a race of rulers, reveling in luxury, lording it over countless subjects, finally, their numbers increased rapidly, no longer kept down by the scant subsistence of arid grasslands and scattered oases. In a similar way, the Arab of the desert became transformed into the sedentary lord of Spain. In the luxuriance of field and orchard which his skillful methods of irrigation and tillage produced, in the growing predominance of the intellectual over the nomadic military life, of the complex affairs of city and mart over the simple tasks of herdsman or cultivator, he lost the benefit of the early harsh training and there with his hold upon his Iberian empire. Biblical history gives us the picture of the Sheikh Abraham, accompanied by his nephew Lot, moving up from the rainless plains of Mesopotamia with his flocks and herds into the better watered Palestine. There his descendants in the garden land of Canaan became an agricultural people, and the problem of Moses and the judges was to prevent their assimilation in religion and custom to the settled Semitic tribes about them, and to make them preserve the ideals born in the starry solitudes of the desert. Retrogression in New Habitat The change from the nomadic to the sedentary life represents an economic advance. Sometimes removal to strongly contrasted geographic conditions necessitates a reversion to a lower economic type of existence. The French colonists who came to Lower Canada in the 17th and 18th centuries found themselves located in a region of intense cold, 
where arable soil was inferior in quality and limited in amount, producing no staple like the tobacco of Virginia or the wheat of Maryland or the cotton of South Carolina or the sugar of the West Indies, by which a young colony might secure a place in European trade. But the snow-wrapped forests of Canada yielded an abundance of fur-bearing animals, the fineness and thickness of whose pelts were born of this frozen north. Into their remotest haunts at the head of Lake Superior or of Hudson Bay, long lines of rivers and lakes open level water roads a thousand miles or more from the crude little colonial capital at Quebec. And over in Europe beaver hats and fur-trimmed garments were all the style. So the plodding farmer from Normandy and the fisherman from Poitou, transferred to Canadian soil, were irresistibly drawn into the adventurous life of the trapper and fur trader. The fur trade became the accepted basis of colonial life, the voyageurs and courier de bois, clad in skins, paddling up ice rimmed streams in their birch bark canoes, fraternizing with Indians who were their only companions in that bleak interior, and married off into dusky squaws, became assimilated to the savage life about them and reverted to the lower hunter stage of civilization. 76. The Boers of South Africa Another pronounced instance of rapid retrogression under new unfavorable geographic conditions is afforded by the South African Boer. The transfer from the busy commercial cities of the Rhinemouths to the faraway periphery of the world's trade, from the intensive agriculture of small delta gardens and the scientific dairy farming of the moist Netherlands to the semi-arid pastures of the high, treeless felt, where they were barred from contact with the vivifying sea and its shipborne commerce, has changed the enterprising 17th-century Hollander into the conservative pastoral boar. Dutch cleanliness has necessarily become a tradition to a people who can scarcely find water for their cattle. The comfort and solid bourgeois elegance of the Dutch home lost its material equipment in the Great Trek, when the long wagon journey reduced household furniture to its lowest terms. Housewifely habits and order vanished in the semi-nomadic life which followed point 77 the gregarious instinct, bred by the closely packed population of Little Holland, was transformed to a love of solitude, which in all lands characterizes the people of a remote and sparsely inhabited frontier. It is a common saying that the boar cannot bear to see another man smoke from his stoop, just as the early Trans-Allegheny pioneer was always on the move westward, because he could not bear to hear his neighbor's watchdog bark. Even the Boer language has deteriorated under the effects of isolation and a lower status of civilization. The native tall differs widely from the polished speech of Holland, it preserves some features of the High Dutch of two centuries ago, but has lost inflections and borrowed words for new phenomena from the English, Kaffirs and Hottentots, can express no abstract ideas, only the concrete ideas of a dull, workaday world. Point seventy-eight. The new habitat may eliminate many previously acquired characteristics and hence transform a people, as in the case of the Boers, or it may intensify tribal or national traits, as in the seafaring propensities of the Angles and Saxons when transferred to Britain, and of the 17th century English when transplanted to the indented coasts of New England, or it may tolerate mere survival or the slow disuetude of qualities which escape any particular pressure in the new environment, and which neither benefit nor handicap in the modified struggle for existence. Notes to Chapter 2 34, Darwin, Origin of Species, Chapter 5, Page 166 New York, 1895 35, Arfirko, Rassenbildung und die Erblichkeit, Bastian Festschrift, Pages 14, 43, 44 Berlin, 1896. 36. Darwin, Descent of Man, pages 34 to 35. New York, 1899. 37. Darwin, Origin of Species, Chap. I, pages 8 to 9. New York, 1895. 38. P. Ehrenreich, Die Erbwohner Brazilians, page 30. Braunschweig, 1897. 39, Ratzel, Die Erde und die das Leben, Volume 1, pages 364, 365. Leipzig in Vienna, 1901. 40, W. Z. Ripley, Races of Europe, pages 79 to 86, 96, 100. New York, 
1899. 41, T. Waits, Anthropology, pages 57 to 58. Edited by J. F. Collingwood. London, 1863. 42, Schoolcraft, Indian Tribes of the United States, Volume 1, pages 198 to 200, 219. Philadelphia, 1853. 43, Darwin, Descent of Man, page 33. New York, 1899. 44, D. Livingstone, Missionary Travels, page 266. New York, 1858. 45, Alaska, 11 Census Report, pages 54, 56. Washington, 1893, and Albert P. Niblack, The Coast Indians of Southern Alaska and Northern British Columbia, page 237. Washington, 1888. 46, Fitzroy, Voyage of the Beagle, Volume 2, pages 130 to 132, 137, 138. London, 1839. 47, H. Bancroft, Native Races, Volume 1, pages 88 to 89. San Francisco, 1886. 48, S. Stanhope Smith, Essay on the Causes of the Variety of Complexion and Figure in the Human Species, pages 103 to 110. New Brunswick and New York, 1810. 49. For full discussion see A. R. Wallace's article on acclimatization in Encyclopedia Britannica and W. Z. Ripley, Races of Europe. Chapter 21. New York, 1899. 50. D. G. Brinton, Races and Peoples, pages 39 to 41. Philadelphia, 1901. 51. Darwin, Descent of Man, pages 34 to 35. New York, 1899. 52. E. F. Knight, Where Three Empires Meet, pages 137 to 138. London, 1897. 53. W. Z. Ripley, Races of Europe, pages 58 to 71, Map. New York, 1898. 54. Ibid, page 566. D. G. Brinton, Races and Peoples, Pages 29 to 30. Philadelphia, 1901. 55. D. Livingstone, Missionary Travels, page 607. New York, 1858. 56. Williams and Calvert, Fiji and the Fijians, page 83, New York, 1859. 57. P. Ehrenreich, Die Herb Warner Brazilians, page 32. Braunschweig, 1897. 58. T. Waits, Anthropology, pages 46 to 49. Edited by Collingwood, London, 1863. 59. Philippine Census, Volume 1, page 552. Washington, 1903. 60. F. Gratzell, History of Mankind, Volume 3, page 106. London, 1908. 61. Major Charles E. Woodruff, the effect of tropical light on the white man, New York, 1905, is a suggestive but not convincing discussion of the theory. 62. W. Z. Ripley, Races of Europe, pages 74 to 77. New York, 1899. 63. Quoted in G. Sergi, The Mediterranean Race, page 73. London and New York, 1901. 64. Ibid. Pages 63 to 69, 74 to 75. 65. T. Waits, Anthropology, pages 44 to 45. Edited by J. F. Collingwood, London, 1863. 66. W. Z. Ripley, Races of Europe, page 76. New York, 1899. 67. For able discussion, see Toppenard, Anthropology, Pages 385 to 392. TR from French, London, 1894. 68. J. Johnson, Jurisprudence of the Isle of Man, pages 44, 71. Edinburgh, 1811. 69. Charles F. Hall, Arctic Researches and Life Among the Eskimo, page 571. 
New York, 1866. Franz Boas, The Central Eskimo, 6th Annual Report of the Bureau of Ethnology, pages 588 to 590. Washington, 1888. 70, Ratzel, History of Mankind, Volume 1, page 35. London, 1896 to 1898. 71, Rosher, National Economic de Ackerbaz, page 34, note 8. Stuttgart, 1888. 72, Elise Reckless, The Earth and Its Inhabitants, Asia, Volume 1, page 171. New York, 1895. 73, Alfred Hetner, Die Geography Dimension, pages 409 to 410 in Geographische Zeitschrift, Volume 13, Number 8. Leipzig, 1907. 74, Yes B. Bolton, The Russian Empire, pages 60 to 64. London, 1882. 75, E.C. Semple, The Anglo Saxons of the Kentucky Mountains, The Geographical Journal, Volume 17, Number 6, pages 588 to 623. London, 1901. 76, E.C. Semple, American History and Its Geographic Conditions, pages 25 to 31. Boston, 1903. The Influence of Geographic Environment on the Lower St. Lawrence, Bull. America Geography Society, Volume 36, pages 449 to 466. New York, 1904. 77, A. R. Calhoun, Afrikanderland, pages 200 to 201. New York, 1906. 78, Gibbard, pages 140 to 145. James Bryce, Impressions of South Africa, page 398. New York, 1897.